don't know nothing about this, but I do. Uh, Hey, can you guys hear me now? You guys can hear me? I put on my earplugs. I know you can hear the background noise as well. Okay, guys. Light, good to see you, sister. It's been a while. I know it's kind of late. Yeah, I had to do this impromptu session because of how, which I had to block for a smart alecky mouth. Hopefully he's going to listen to this because he came here and couldn't behave himself, control himself. So I had to address this because I'm tired of this. It really is. So hopefully by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we won't be distracted. I can't be too loud because we got neighbors and I want to wake them up. So I got my earplug on, but is the sound okay? Just want to make sure the sound is good. Because it's late, we're not going to get <clears throat> the usual number. The Lord Jesus will be done. May he be glorified. So we praise you, Father. We praise you, Lord Jesus, Son of God. We praise you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. Son of God, we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. <clears throat> we ask, Father, in Jesus' name, you bless this session by the power of the Holy Spirit. Anoint me to speak truth without error. Empower me by your Spirit to recall all these verses and these facts and interpret them correctly for the glory of Jesus Christ. May the Lord Jesus increase in us, Father, by your power, by the power of the Holy Spirit, become more like Jesus. May we decrease. And Father, bless everyone who's present. Fill them with wisdom and knowledge, understanding from your spirit. And I beg you, Father, save me from error and misinterpretation so I don't confuse and mislead anyone. Father, in Jesus' name, we trust your spirit to protect us. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Wash our loved ones. In my case, my daughters and blood of Jesus Christ and seal us for your glory, Father. Anoint the words of my mouth to speak truth. Make the sound of my voice pleasing to the ears of your children, Father, the servants of Jesus Christ, sealed by your spirit. <clears throat> Fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life, the health I need to glorify Jesus Christ, to use my sound to glorify Jesus. I never sin against them. Have your way, Father. Lord Jesus, please have your way. And Holy Spirit, have your way. Save us from attacks of the enemy, distractions of Satan. Rebuke the evil one, please, in Jesus' name. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Rapha, Yahovah, Rapha, Yahovah, Rapha, Father, you are our healer. Lord Jesus, you are our healer. Holy Spirit, you are our healer, in Jesus' name. Okay. Yeah, I decided to do this impromptu session <clears throat> because we had someone in the comment section. He came here, identified himself. I wasn't going to mention it, but he came here and identified himself. How a he said he unsubscribed to me as if I'm going to lose sleep. Let me just be clear again. I'm not here to be unnecessarily offensive, and I'm not here to tickle ears. And my prayer is in Jesus' name. I don't prostitute myself for fame or money. May the Lord Jesus save me from that. I don't want to be offensive. I don't want to be a crowd pleaser. I want to be as honest to the Lord Jesus as possible <clears throat> by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I said, make sure the door hits you on your way out. So he came here, couldn't behave himself because he doesn't understand the issue. And therefore, he decided to attack and accuse me pretty much of being inconsistent. Why? Why am I inconsistent? Because I condemn Muslims for being Mohammedans, for deifying Muhammad. But here I am saying that the Bible does teach, the Bible does support the doctrine of the communion of saints. And I pray the Lord Jesus gives me grace not to <clears throat> be a stumbling block and not to be unnecessarily offensive. But again, this again shows the ignorance of people. I had someone else tell me that because I believe in Sola Scriptura, that what I'm saying contradicts Scripture. And that's why that person doesn't feel comfortable. Now, folks, I don't know. I don't know how clear I could have been in the sessions. Can I, and God is listening if I'm lying. The Lord will be my judge. You guys heard me say that the reason why I ended up embracing the communion of saints is because of the biblical evidence, right? Because of the scriptural evidence, the plethora of verses that convince me. And I'm trusting it's because the Holy Spirit enabled me to accept what the scriptures teach, that I've come to embrace this doctrine, right? How many times have I said that? Okay. And I'm going to say it again before the Lord. 
If my interpretation of these passages are incorrect, I pray the Holy Spirit corrects it in me, saves me from error, saves you from error, and only confirm me in the truth of Scripture. Okay. But I've said it, and I'm going to repeat it again. I did not come to embrace communion of saints because of tradition. It's not I hate tradition. <clears throat> but any tradition that I feel contradicts the Bible, I reject. I came to accept this doctrine because of the plethora of verses that I heard the Catholics and the Orthodox, specifically Catholics, use against the Protestants and the responses to the Protestant objections. And then I took that information and I meditate upon the arguments from the scriptures over and over again. And I came to embrace this reluctant, reluctantly because I want to be a biblicist. I want to accept the scriptures and all it teaches, even if it goes against the norms. This is why I ended up embracing it. So it's because I affirm sola scriptura, which many of the people here deny, but because I affirm it, that's why I accepted it. So I just want to be clear. So please don't come and tell me that somehow, Tom, why do you say relax, brother? You know, those are trigger words. You're triggering me. When you tell me relax, you're being disrespectful as if I'm your dog or your son and talking down to me. Why, why would you do that? And no, it's not solo scriptura. It's sola scriptura and tota scriptura. Sola. Solo is different. Tom, don't disrespect me like this, brother, because it's not going to bode well for you if you disrespect me, talk down to me as if I'm a child. Okay, brother? Please, out of love for me, and I want to love you, and I don't want to offend you. Okay? So now, let's focus by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So please, don't let the enemy distract us. Let's focus. I'm going to repeat. You may think my interpretation of the passages are wrong, but you know what? <clears throat> Isn't it, guys, help me to help you. Okay, help me to help you. Isn't it true that even those who affirm Sola Scriptura, they hold positions that others who believe in Sola Scriptura deny is scriptural? For example, you have Calvinists like James White who believe in the five points of Calvinism. Then you have others who are also who believe in Sola Scriptura like Leighton Flowers, provisionists who say, the five points of Calvinism are a distortion of Scripture. A distortion of Scripture. Follow with me, guys. Our distortion of Scripture, right? Okay, a view vendor. Follow with me, view vendor. Play attention. And the five point Calvinists say provisionism is a distortion of Scripture. Then you have open theists who say provisionism and the five points of Calvinism are a distortion of Scripture. And also, you have Molinists. Now, what am I getting at? Each of these positions believe that they are embracing Sola Scriptura and affirming Sola Scriptura. And because they submit to Sola Scriptura, that the scriptures are the absolute authority, that their position is biblical. And the others think that the persons embracing the opposing view is wrong, right? Guys, don't worry about the numbers. Focus, please. For the glory of Jesus, focus. Focus. You with me there? So Leighton Flowers, who's a provisionist, believes that he is a provisionist because the Bible forces him to accept it. And he thinks that James White's Calvinism is a distortion of Scripture. But he believes he's still affirming sola scriptura. James White thinks that his five-point Cal five Calvinism is scriptural and that provisionism is a distortion of Scripture. And he believes he's affirming sola scriptura. So please don't accuse me of abandoning sola scriptura because I believe the Bible teaches communion of saints. You can't accuse me of misinterpreting the Bible or misunderstanding the Bible. Guys, why are you letting the devil distract you because of the numbers? What's the numbers got to do with anything? Can you just focus, please? I don't know. It's, it's probably some gizmo, some trick that does that. Just focus, please. And hopefully... If there's 500, then they'll hit the like button. Please, why are you letting the devil distract you? Yeah, it's, it's what it is. It's YouTube acting up. Okay, focus. All right. So please don't accuse me of embracing this doctrine contrary to Scripture. You can say that I'm misunderstanding Scripture, misinterpreting Scripture. Okay? But don't say I <clears throat> am embracing it because I'm abandoning Scripture. Then you'd be lying and slandering me. Before the Lord Jesus, I just said I came to this position because of the plethora of scriptural support. Okay, if I'm wrong, may the Spirit show me where I'm wrong. I've heard the best 
<clears throat> arguments from the other side, and I think they're weak and they're bad. Again, that's probably because I don't see as clearly as they do. But I trust the Holy Spirit to guide me. So I just want to be clear. Now I want to deal with another pathetic objection. Here's a pathetic objection. Okay. My embracing intercession of saints means I'm inconsist inconsistent because I condemn Muslims for being Mohammedans for deifying Muhammad. Now, what do I mean by deifying Muhammad? Deification means to view someone or make someone divine. Deify. To turn someone into a divine being, a deity. Okay, does everyone understand what deification is? See, thank you, Acts 17 Apologetics. That should be assigned to you, friend. That should be assigned to you, Acts 17 Apologetics. Embrace communion of saints, and maybe you'll be more holy and sanctified and not the greatest white supremacist the world has known. But get, bring me your thousand to my live stream, by the grace of Jesus Christ. Anyway, everyone listening to me? Okay. I want you to focus because Satan's going to try to distract us, but we rebuke him in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, the authority of Jesus Christ. Okay, let me repeat again. Let me repeat again. Deification means to make someone or view someone or to turn someone into divine, a deity, right? Muslims have turned Muhammad into a deity, a divine being, even though they deny it. Now, the accusation is my embracing... The biblical basis for intercession of saints means I'm inconsistent when I attack Mohammedans. Now, I want to refute that. Now, as I refute that, let me give you some articles. Article number one. Article number one. Here you go. Can you save these links, guys? You promise me to save these links? Yep. Yep. Okay, here you go. Article number one, first article. First article. Click on it. Save it. Print it out. Study it. Teach it, use it for the glory of Jesus Christ. That's the first article. That's article number one. Let me post the link again. Follow with me, guys, please. Follow with me. It's got to be YouTube acting up because if we had 400 people, then we'd expect like them hitting the like button. Okay. Article number two. Article number two. Article number two. Save that article. Click on it. You have my permission to print it out or upload it to your websites. Teach it. Use it to glorify Christ. Okay. Article number three. Article number three. Okay. Let me just explain why I can believe in the biblical basis for intersection of saints and still condemn Mohammedans for deifying Muhammad. Do you know why? Do you know why? Are you ready now for the response to this? So that hopefully when I'm done with this, people are going to stop attacking and slandering. If they want to, then that's between them and the Lord. Do you guys know why? Let me explain to you the difference. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible does it say that if you invoke someone in heaven, that's necessarily an act of worship. Let me repeat this again. Invoking someone, asking someone, is never defined as an exclusive act of worship given to God alone. Okay, okay you guys got to hear. If you don't hear, then you won't know why I'm not inconsistent like David Wood. David Wood is the most inconsistent white hypocrite the world has known, but we still love him and forgive him for the sake of Jesus. Okay. You will not find a single place in the Bible where invoking someone, asking someone, is considered an act of worship given to God alone. You will not find anywhere in the Bible a condemnation, right, of asking an angel, let's just stick with angel, to pray for you or to assist you <clears throat> before God. Are you with me there? Exactly. See, this, guy, this guy's got too much hand, uh, you know. Now, this is unlike Islam. Do you know why? In Islam, Muhammad said, invoking, invocation, supplication, dua, the Arabic word, the technical term is dua, is worship. Do you understand the first difference? Okay. Guys, don't get into side talks. Just listen and learn. Help me to help you. Just listen and learn. Because you guys are trying to defend a position. Just listen and learn. Let me address the issue. Benefit from my limited knowledge, so you don't become like David Wood, an inconsistent white supremacist, okay? Now, 
Number uh, the difference again. Let me repeat: invoking, asking for for the aid of the angelic host or believers are glorifying presence of Christ is not condemned as worship. It's not condemned as worship. Whereas Muhammad said, Muhammad said, invoke invoking someone, invocation, supplication is worship. Are you guys not ready for the meat? Are you ready now to unpack it? This all comes from my article. Yeah. Okay, here's the third article. Here's the third article. I didn't give you this. Here you go. Now, we're not going to be able to copy and paste them, so I'm going to read them for you. So, guys, understand the difference. We're going to take it step by step to silence the silly argument. Okay? To silence the silly ar argument. Okay. Okay, now, here it goes. This is from... Sunan Abu Dawood. This comes from Abu Dawood. It's a hadith from Abu Dawood. Taken from uh, Riyadh al-Salahin. Riyadh al-Salahin, but it's quoting Abu Dawood. So I said the Sunan Abu Dawood because that's his hadith collection. But it's quoting Abu Dawood and Riyadh al-Salahin. Now, it's all in my article, folks. It's all in my article. So save the links. Now, guys, I do need you to listen so you can benefit. If you don't listen, you're not going to benefit. You won't learn the difference. Please help me to help you because I want you to be as biblical as possible. And faithful to scripture to glorify Jesus Christ and see the difference. Here's what Muhammad said. This is 17, the book of dua, supplications. I notice what he said. And Numan bin Bashir or Bashir reported. The prophet said dua, supplication is worship. The prophet said dua, supplication is worship. Here you go. Guys, let me post it. No, Keith is back. Keith, my man, is back. A five-point Calvinist is not as heretical as David would, but he's getting there. Okay. Okay, now, follow with me. You see that there? You see what Muhammad said? Muhammad said dua is worship. Did you catch it? What's dua? Invocation, supplication. He said that. Okay, now follow with me. Orthodox uh, defense, do me a favor. If someone is distracting you and bringing up these silly objections, let me know because that for that, they'll get blocked because they're not waiting. They're not being patient. Willie, if he wants to be a know-it-all, he's not going to last here. Willie Mays, he's going to be sent on his merry way because he hasn't even heard the case and he's already arguing, arguing to make himself look like a fool. I'm not going to tolerate fools today. Listen and let's finish by the grace of God. Are you ready now? Okay, so a couple more narrations. Couple more narrations. Here, this comes from Al Adab Al Mufrad Al Bukhari. Al Adab Al Mufrad Al Bukhari, translated by Aisha Buli, the section on supplication. Okay, the excellence of supplication. Here, let me post it for you. Let's see what it says. You ready, guys? Listen. Don't let Satan distract you. Okay, here it goes. Number 712, Abu Huraira reported that the Prophet said, nothing is dearer to Allah than supplication. Nothing is dearer to Allah than supplication. Now here, number 713. Number 713. Okay, watch here, guys. Pay attention. Yeah, send Willie Mays out of here, Christos. Send this, this brain dog, this rabid dog out of here for attacking pathetic arguments that have been refuted. Please, I'm not going to tolerate people here. 713. Abu Huraira reported that the Prophet said, the noblest act of worship is supplication. The noblest act of worship is supplication. Did you catch it? You guys catch it? Okay. Try this again. Read with me, folks. In Jesus' name, let's focus. If you don't focus, you're not going to benefit. Okay. Muhammad said, supplicating is worship. Supplicating is the heart of worship. Not the Bible. The Bible doesn't say that. Okay, let me give you a couple more. Okay, this comes from English translation of Sunan Ibn Majah. This is all in my article, Sunan Ibn Majah. Okay, Sunan Ibn Majah. Okay, here you go. Read with me. Let me post it twice. Okay, number 3828 in English. It was narrated from Numan bin Bashir or Bashir that the Messenger of Allah said, Indeed, the supplication is the worship. Indeed, the supplication is the worship. And he quotes a chronic verse, chapter 40, verse 60. 
Then he recited, and your Lord said, invoke me, I will respond to you. Invoke me, I will respond to you. Okay, so you guys got it? Did you guys catch it? Okay. Does everyone see Muhammad said to ask and invoke is worship? That means if there are narrations where Muslims are asking a dead man, Muhammad, who's under the curse of Jesus Christ, according to Muhammad's teaching, that's worship. According to Muhammad's teaching, that's worship. But you'll not find a single place in the Bible that says invoking or supplicating is worship. You see the difference now. In other words, folks, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth because that's what he does. So I've thought about these issues and I've reflected on these issues and I've meditated on the differences. I didn't just come overnight, right? Because when I hear David Wood espou espousing his heresies, his pathetic heresies, his shameless butchering of scripture and torturing people with his long, boring sessions where he speaks for 99% of the time, I didn't want to be that. David Wood exists to teach us what not to be like as Christians. You look at David Wood, that's not what you need to be as a Christian. So he serves a purpose. This is what a Christian shouldn't be. So we thank him for that. You with me there? Are we thankful or what? Now, by the way, for those of you who don't know, David Wood is in the channel. He's bantering with me, so we're bantering back and forth. It's not serious. Why do you hate David Wood, brother? One sister told me, why are you wishing David Wood could die? Well, I'm praying he dies so I can get all his subscribers. If he dies, then I'll come to me because I have nowhere else to go. Okay. Now, did you understand the first difference? What's the difference? Does everyone understand the difference now? Muhammad said invoking, invoking, supplicating, especially someone who's not alive on the earth, that's worship. Now, here's my challenge for all of you guys who falsely accuse this doctrine of intercession of saints being the same thing as me accusing Muslims of, of deifying Muhammad. I want you to show me. Here's my challenge. I want you to show me single place in the Bible that says invocation, supplicating, asking is worship. Air Church, focus, guys, please, in Jesus' name. Can you help me? Don't worry about the numbers. Just focus. Let's glorify Christ. Do you see the difference now? This is comparing apples and pineapples, right? So that's the first refutation. And there are narrations in my articles where they are supplicating a dead man and speaking to a dead man. For instance, when they pray five times a day, follow with me. When they pray five times a day, five times a day, part of their prayers includes tashahud. Tashahud is where they bear, they bear witness, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. And then they speak to Muhammad, a dead man. They go, As-salamu alayka, ahiyu nabi According to Muhammad, that's worship. They're worshiping him. Does everyone understand that? Does everyone see the difference now? Did I make that point clear? Because it's not going to be a long session. Umberto, you're a hater, bro. Because you're a hater because I blocked you the other day. Right? And so now you think that David Wood is the bomb. Hey, sister, how are you? Good to see you, Amanda. Maria Butterfly. Okay. Okay, everyone clear? Everyone understand the point? Who's not understanding the point? So now someone told me, I'd like you to prove to me that the Hail Mary is not prayer. Okay, let me repeat the Hail Mary. Okay, you guys ready now? Because I'm going to systematically refute these objections so I don't hear this anymore. And now you have it on record. I'm going to repeat it again. I didn't embrace the communion of saints because of tradition. I embraced it because of the plethora of passages that were used and me agonizing over them, meditating on them, until finally I yielded. And I trust that was because the Holy Spirit caused me to yield. Yes, supplication. Supplicating means to invoke. That's simply two different words saying the same thing. I'm invoking you. I'm supplicating you. Right? Okay, now let me explain to you. Why the Hail Mary is not worship. Let me explain to you. You can reject my view. That's fine. Okay, let's recite it. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. <clears throat> Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Now and, at the, uh, uh, now and at the hour of our death. Okay. 
Let's break it down. The first part, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. That's in the Bible. That's the words of Gabriel and the words of Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's go to Luke one twenty eight. Let me show you. Let me break it down. Let me address that. Luke one twenty eight. Okay, Luke one twenty eight. Guys, let me do this. I know you're trying to help me. I know especially you Orthodox and Catholic, you're excited. Just hear me out. Let me do it by the grace of God. I can do this by the grace of God. Okay. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail thou, thou, the, uh, hail thou that art highly favored. Kekeritomeni. Some will translate it as hail full of grace. The word is kekeritomeni. Kekeritomeni. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Now, if saying that part is prayer, it, Gabriel just prayed to Mary. Gabriel just prayed to Mary. You see the logic? Now, let's go to Luke 1, 41 to 42, specifically verse 42. Ooh. At mods today, because it's a special session, any nuisances and distractions and anything that's off topic, send them on their merry way. Okay, Luke 1, 41, 42. Okay, read with me. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe le leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now notice, and she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Wow, the first part of the rosary, or the Hail Mary, is in the Bible. It's Gabriel and Elizabeth, and Elizabeth's filled with the Holy Spirit. So if reciting that is, is prayer, then that means Gabriel and Elizabeth prayed to Mary. You with me there? But they'll say, oh, but... She was alive, and they were talking to her directly. Well, that's the whole point. Who said she's dead? She's alive in the presence of Christ, glorified, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit makes her aware of what's taking place. You get my point? Oh, but they were talking to her directly, and she could hear them, and she's alive. Well, who told you she's dead and she's not alive? And who told you? that she can't hear you by the power of the Holy Spirit. I already documented that in the previous sessions. Folks, I've thought about these issues. You understand? I thought about those issues. And I've now you see why I embrace it because of Scripture, not because of tradition, because of Scripture, not because of tradition, man. You don't believe me? Then that's between you and the Lord. That's another subject that I don't know how solid the evidence is for Razus. But don't change subject. Let's focus on this. Let's just focus on this because that's about the assumption and the dormition. You're going to get me off topic, Razus. And I know you like to do that. You like to flatten my earth. You like to give out my social security and, you know, where I hang out. It's okay, Razus. Listen, bro, I know you're upset that I'm a Syrian and you're Chaldean, and you think Chaldeans are not Assyrians. You are Assyrian. Live with it, bro, and stop hating, bro, and stop hating my people. Now, fo focus with me. Okay. You guys going to let the devil cause you to be distracted. Rebuke him in Jesus' name. Now, focus with me. Okay. What about the part that says, Holy Mary, Mother of God, <clears throat> pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death? Okay. Unless you believe that you can't ask someone in heaven to pray for you, then what's wrong with that part? See, this is begging the question. This assumes what you've yet to prove, that Mary can't hear you, so you can't say, Holy Mary. Well, number one, she is holy. Anyone who is in heaven is perfectly holy, separate from the world, separate from sin. So she is holy. Number two, I've already established from Scripture, she is the mother of God. I've given you proof she's the mother of God in the flesh. So here's my question. Here's my question. Can you conclusively prove that she cannot be aware of people asking for her to pray with them before the Lord Jesus? If you can, then you have a case. But that's why I did a multi-part series showing that biblically those in heaven, by the power of God, by the power of Christ, by the power of the Spirit, <clears throat> are made aware of things that take place on earth. So can you show me what's unbiblical about that? <laughs> David was such a hater, dude. You, you make a terrible uh, uh, Protestant. You're already a terrible apologist. 
Okay, so the only way you're going to refute this, here, let me tell you how to refute this. Not by saying, well, I'm inconsistent because I condemn Muslims for being <clears throat> Muhammadans, deifying Muhammad. That ain't going to work. That shows you're ignorant. You don't understand. And it's not going to work by, throwing, by telling me <clears throat> that they're dead and they can't hear you because you need to prove that. You see my point? You need to prove that they're dead to us and can't hear us. That's the entire point of the debate, isn't it? Everyone with me here? Is everyone clear? I just want to make sure. So now with that said, what about condemning Muhammad for smooching, licking, and smothering a black stone? Am I being inconsistent for condemning him for doing that, whereas I just stated and wrote an article that the Bible does not condemn, listen to what I'm saying, the Bible does not condemn images, icons that you show respect to and venerate. No, I'm not being inconsistent there either. Now, let me make a case. Let me make a case from Scripture that icons and images in of themselves are not idolatrous. Let me show you. Are you ready now? Let me give you that article. I forgot to get you that article. Hold on. Oh, I forgot to get you that article. Hold on, man. I wrote an article on this. Guys, please click them, save them, and use them. By the way, the real reason why David Wood is here, believe it or not, he's learning theology because he has no theology. His theology sucks, so he's here learning. Here's the article. Okay. Let me show you what God is saying about images. Uh, Shanibi, Shanibi, can you hold that question for another session? Because I want to finish this session. If you ask me questions that take me off topic, then you defeat the purpose of the session. Okay, let's go to Exodus 20. Let's read verses 3 to 5. Exodus 20, verses 3 to 5. I don't know why it's hard for Christians to constrain themselves and pay attention. Okay. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness or of anything that is in heaven. See, don't make any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Okay, so this seems to be clear, right? This seems to be clear. Dan Roach, if you don't like I'm, that I'm a dictator, then go to David Wood's channel. Don't come here. You're not. No one asks you to come. Okay, now focus. Is God condemning images altogether, or is he condemning making images of creatures that you worship as gods and goddesses, that you take as gods and goddesses? You with me there? Now, you see this word, kerubim? You need to block him for that insult. Intercession of saints versus Jesus. So send him back to his mother for insulting the Lord that way. Okay. Is God condemning images altogether or condemning an image of a creature that you take as a god or goddess and worship that god or goddess? I'll let God explain. Let's go to Exodus 25, 18 to 22. Exodus 25, 18 to 22. Guys, if you trust me and if you're patient, if you just be patient, you'll get your answers. If you just be patient. Okay, now let's read Exodus 25, 18 to 22. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. Okay, two cherubims of gold. Of beaten work shalt thou make them and the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub. Cherub is a spirit creature that's before the throne of God in heaven. So God is telling Moses, make an image of cherubim. Oh, wow. And make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two thereof, right? You watch with me. Two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. <clears throat> Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat, the mercy seat representing the throne of God in heaven, 
above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee, the Ten Commandments. Now watch here, verse 22. And there I will meet with thee. Pay attention. Pay attention. And there I will meet with thee. Where? At the mercy seat with the cherubim. I'm going to descend there and meet with you there. Guys, don't forget verse 22. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Okay, did you catch it? God, who said, make no images of anything in heaven, on earth, in the seas below, and worship them as gods or goddesses, just told Moses, make an image of creatures in heaven, cherubim, they're in heaven, and make an image of my throne, the mercy seat. Was God contradicting himself? Was God contradicting himself? Lyles, you're asking me questions that are not related to the point. You know that, right, brother? I don't know why you guys can't understand. I'm going to repeat it five times. Christians, control yourselves. Why ask questions that are going to get me off topic? I know David Wood is here to cause division. He's the greatest church planner the world has known. Every church he goes to, he causes division and creates two churches. So he multiplies churches because of creating division. Okay, now. Let's focus. Joshua 7, verse 6. Joshua 7, verse 6. Joshua 7, verse 6. Watch here. Big Zoots, which part of the cherubim was in an image? Are you that stupid, Big Zoots? Are you a big idiot? The cherubim with wings? Hello. Okay, now read, guys. Read. Joshua 7, verse 6. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord. Wait, wait, wait. He fell before the ark of the Lord? He fell prostrate before the ark that Moses fashioned that had cherubim with wings outstretched? Until eventide, he and the elders of Israel put dust upon their heads. Post it one more time. I don't think people caught it. Joshua 7, verse 6. Sandeep, answer this question. You just have the Bible contradict itself because you're a genius, brother. Good job, Sandeep. Read Joshua 7, 6. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord. Until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel put dust upon their heads. So I want to ask a question. Why is Joshua and the elders falling before this image of the ark with cherubim? Go to 1 Samuel 4, verse 4. 1 Samuel 4, verse 4. Everything clear? Okay. 1 Samuel 4, verse 4. Watch here. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the Son of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. You see what? Why? Because they knew that God's presence somehow was connected with the ark. That God, in some <clears throat> mysterious way, made his presence connected to the ark so that his presence was local, localized <clears throat> there with the ark in some mysterious way. Right? 1 Samuel 5, verse 4. Elijah's rock is tempted to get blocked for bringing up first first timothy 2 5 why is it staticky guys here is it staticky now i don't know why it's just staticky hello how about now is it staticky hello hello my friend hello how about now i don't know that's not up to me that's satan lord jesus rebuked the evil one lord jesus rebuked the evil one amen i don't know what to tell you please lord jesus rebuke the evil one I don't know what to tell you. Please, my God, follow the Son of Spirit, Jesus, mother. Yeah, that's attack of the devil because we're getting a good crowd and a good subject. Okay, if it's not too bad, it's still good enough for me to continue or should I stop? Pray with me because you know this is satanic warfare, right? No, it's not so much he didn't touch his feet on the ground, Talitha Kumi, because there are passages where he touched his feet on the ground. 
He did touch his ground. Okay. All right. First Samuel five verse four. First Samuel five verse four. Okay. First Samuel five verse four. I don't know why it's static. I don't know. And when they arose early on the morrow, on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon. This was the false god of the Philistines. Was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. See, I don't think you got it. First Samuel 5 verse 4. I don't think you got it. Let's pay attention again. And when they arose early, the Philistines rose early and they saw their statue of Dagon, their false god was fallen upon his face. Even a statue fell prostrate before the Ark of the Covenant. Fell upon his face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to them. Folks, can I ask you a question? The Philistines were shocked that this happened because they knew no man did it. What does this tell you about the Ark of the Lord, that an idol of a false god? is found prostrating before it with the hands and the feet cut off. What does that tell you? 1 Samuel 6, verse 19. 1 Samuel 6, verse 19. Okay? Okay, we, I got that, terrible. Now watch here. 1 Samuel 6, verse 19. It's all in my article, by the way. Okay, here's my article again. All of this and more is in my article. 1 Samuel 6, 19. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote the people, 50,000 and threescore. Look how many people he killed. 50,000, threescore, that's uh, 60, and 10 men. That's what? 50, Man, this old English is killing me. 50,000. I, I don't know. I can't do the old English. Ah, King James, as much as I love you, you break my heart because I can't figure you out. Over 50,000 men were killed just by looking into the ark, just for looking into the ark. They looked into the ark. And they were unclean, sinful, pagan idolaters. They looked into the ark and they were killed dead. Over 50,000. Let's see why again. 2 Samuel 6, verses 1 and 2. I don't care if you don't get my, my point, Igor. My point is you have an image of cherubim, angels attached to the ark. You don't get that point? Then you got to go, my friend. Bye-bye. 2 Samuel 6, verse 1 and 2, because everyone else is getting it. Okay. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah, to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of Jehovah, the Lord of hosts, that dwelleth between the cherubims. Did you catch it? The ark of the covenant is where God's presence was attached. God attached his presence in a unique, miraculous way to that ark. So to be in front of the ark was to be in the presence of God. And if you were approaching God's presence in an unholy, unclean manner, you would be struck dead. Okay, now let me ask you a question. Why did God commission the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, and the cherubim to be fashioned, which are icons, idols, images? If God is against having images, because he's not against having images, you know what God is against? Having an image of a creature that you worship as a god or goddess. Okay? Let me give you further proof God is not against images. Okay? Let me give you further proof. Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9. Yes, well, they're not so much angels. They're spirit creatures, but you can call them angels. If you use the term angel in a broader sense, it means spirit creatures. Okay, Numbers 21, 4 to 9. Guys, read with me. 
And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way, right? And the people spake against God. Watch here. The people spake against God and against Moses. Whereof, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord Jehovah sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people and much of the people of Israel died. Now watch. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord Jehovah and against thee. Pray unto the Lord the Jehovah that he, that he <clears throat> take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And Jehovah said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent. Here again, God is having him fashion an image of something crawling on the earth, which the Ten Commandments said you're not supposed to do. Okay. And Jehovah said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, and when he looketh upon it, that image, when he looks to that image, it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a certain had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Okay, now here's my point. God has Moses fashion an image of a crawling thing of the earth, a serpent. And he has them lift up that serpent and has people looking to that image to be healed. Why? Why is God using an image of a serpent that people have to look to to be healed if he's against images? Before I move on. You with me there? Why is God having Moses fashion an image of a serpent and then having people look to that serpent, that image, to be healed? Otherwise, they wouldn't be healed if he's against images. Because he's not against images. That's the point. The images that he condemns are images of creatures that you worship as gods and goddesses. You want me there? So the Ten Commandments do not condemn having an image, an icon. It condemns taking an image of a creature and then worshiping it as a god or goddess. Now let me ask the Orthodox here, and the Catholics. When you have an icon or an image of John the Baptist, do you view that figure, John the Baptist, as God? Is he God? Okay, when you have an image of the Blessed Mother of Christ, do you see her as a goddess that you worship? You got to send the Chaldean out of here. He's being disrespectful. He's a little punk. Get him out of here. He's a disgrace to the community. Okay, so what does the Bible condemn? The Bible condemns having an image of a creature, a creature that you view as a god and goddess and worshiping that creature. So now let me show you what God had Hezekiah do to that bronze serpent when the Israelites started worshiping it as a God, as a deity. Let me show you. 2 Kings 18, verses 1 to 4. 2 Kings 18, verses 1 to 4. The flamboyant one. Let me get off topic so I can explain to you pictures of Jesus. Come on, man. Focus. 2 Kings 18, verses 1 to 4. Read with me. Now it came to pass, it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, the king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old when he was he when he began to, to reign. And he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of Jehovah. So he did what was right in the sight of Jehovah, according to all that David his father had did had done. Pay attention now. Pay attention. In verse 4. He removed the high places. The high places is where Israel would come 
and worship gods and goddesses like uh, Astarte and Baal. And they would commit orgies in their perversion. And he break the images and cut down the groves. And notice what he did. And break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and called it Nehushtan. Did you see what happened? You guys, you see what happened? Do you see what happened? When the Israelites took the bronze serpent of Moses and then combined it with the idols of gods and goddesses and then started worshiping it uh, with the gods and goddesses, goddesses, treating it as a deity, that's when it became sinful and idolatrous and that's when God had it destroyed. How you doing, brother? You with me there? So what made God move Hezekiah to destroy the bronze serpent when God himself had it fashioned? Yes, it is, my beloved shepherd. You know why? Because in Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10, Daniel sees God the Father appear as an elderly person, an older person with white hair and a white robe, and Jesus Christ appearing as the Son of Man. Don't ask me that question right now, beloved shepherd. Let's focus. Okay, did everyone get the point? When they took an image that God himself ordered to be made and deified it, deified it, treated it as a deity to be worshipped with gods and goddesses, that's when it had to be destroyed. Clear with everyone? You understand now. So if you let the Bible interpret the Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth, a lot of things that I was taught as a Protestant are unbiblical. You got to get rid of it. So I either have a choice. Do I want to still be a Protestant or do I want to be a Biblicist and trust whatever the Bible teaches as long as the Holy Spirit is guiding me to understand the Bible correctly? And if I see something in Protestantism contradicts the Bible, you got to go. You got to go. I'm sorry. I don't want to be Protestant for the sake of being Protestant. I want to be a Biblicist, and I keep saying that. So when you falsely accuse me, Sam, you say Thelith, your Torah, and I don't think it's Scripture. Well, then you're blind. I see it. Prove me wrong. Don't accuse me of violating Sola Scriptura. Is that clear? Hopefully after today, man, I'm going to be done with this. I hope I... I, hope I this is where... If you had a godly wife, if I had a godly wife, I was married to a godly wife who's beautiful, love Jesus, I'd say, I need some love. Hug me, baby. <laughs> oh, I love you. Right? Not to me. I believe Sola Scriptura is biblical. We can have that discussion in a future session. This is, this is one of those things. But let's not turn it into a Sola Scriptura debate, please. Okay. Right. No, it's not. No, that's not what it's saying. Brata Mshicha. They were burning incense as an act of worship to a false god. Burning incense in of itself is not sinful. It's when you burn incense to an object that's a creature that you take to be a god or goddess. You want me there? Before I move on to the next point. Yeah, that's Igor, that's fine. Igor, listen to me, brother. When you see someone that's taking an icon of a saint and thinking it has magical powers, rebuke that person because they're going against even the tradition of their church. If you think the icons have magical power and it's like a magical formula, presto, abracadabra, condemn them, rebuke them. Musho, Betis, brother, you see what you're doing now? You're trying to start a sectarian debate. To be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. That was Bishop, was it not Fulton Sheen? Uh, Cardinal John Henry Newman. But B Musho, do you know what? Okay, we stopped being Protestant. What do you want us to be, Orthodox? Or do you want us to be Catholic? Or do you want us to be Coptic? Or do you want us to be a Syrian Church of the East? Do you see? When you say those kind of stuff, 
you only embarrass yourself because ceasing to be Protestant doesn't automatically make me Catholic. I can end up being Orthodox or I can end up being Coptic or I can end up being a Syrian Church of the East. You see, brother, what you do? You When you open your mouth, you stick both of your feet in it. You get my point? I've been there, and I'm going to say it like a broken record. Been there, done that, and got the T-shirt. To be deep in histories, to cease to be Protestant. And that was Cardinal John Henry Newman. Oh, but Mr. Uh, Newman, does that automatically mean I become Roman Catholic? Because my Orthodox brothers tell me if I study the church fathers, I will join their church, not Rome. Yeah. Oh, you didn't think about that one, did you? Booyah. See, here we go again. Monster Dub, can you do me a favor? Can you stop talking about the Pope is demonic? And I know there are many Catholics here to agree with you that Francis is not a legitimate Pope. He's a leftist Mar Marxist and agent of Satan. But can we not talk about that, please? See, you guys are letting the devil win. Do you guys want Jesus to be glorified or you want the devil to win? Can we focus, man? Can we focus, please? Okay, now that said. Uh, the cutoff points, what the Bible, Alpha and Omega. I don't know your heart. If you're stupid enough to take the icon as it, as a creature who is God worthy of your worship, then God will damn you. I don't know your heart. If you know what the Bible teaches, and you know that these are not gods or goddesses, but creatures who are finite, who are empowered by God to do the work that God sent them to do for the glory of Jesus, or are now glorified in his presence. And you know that, and that's why you're honoring that image, then you're being biblical. I can't tell you you're being unbiblical. In fact, folks, can I ask you a question for you Protestants here? For you Protestants. What's the difference? You're going to say, well, there's a major difference. No, there's no. If you're against images of Jesus and Mary, right? How many of you would say, I have a problem with an image of Mary? Then if you have a problem with an image of Mary, then why do you watch movies where an actress depicts Mary? Derek, I'm not insulting their Pope. I'm telling you what the Catholics here believe, like Alan Rujo. He'll tell you that Francis is a leftist Marxist. He's corrupt, and he's not a true Pope. So don't accuse me of insulting anybody. And Alan Rujo is a devout Christian whom I love dearly. Okay, now, devout Catholic Christian. Now, now listen. If you're against having an image of Mary, why then do you go see the Passion of Christ and see an actress play Mary? or Jesus of Nazareth, why the inconsistency? If you're going to be consistent, be consistent across the board. No Jesus films, no films about any biblical character. Why do you watch Moses? Why do you do that? Because you don't know what they look like, right? So then why are you watching a movie where an actor, you, you're telling me Moses looked like Charlton Heston? Yeah, even children's Bible with pictures. If you're going to be consistent, then don't watch Jesus movies or cartoons or any movie of any biblical character because those are actors and these are cartoons <clears throat> depicting Jesus and his blessed mother or disciples or Moses, and we don't know what they look like. So stop watching them. You get my point now? Is it making sense? Am I making sense? Am I helping you? And do you know there are Protestants who won't watch Jesus movies? You know there are Protestants who won't watch Jesus films for that very reason? Because they think it's a violation of the commandment of God? Do you know that? See, at least they're consistent. But when you're a Protestant, you tell me, well, that icon, that's not biblical. We don't know what Mary looks like. And you're the first one that goes to see the Passion of the Christ or Jesus of Nazareth. And you're bawling, the actress playing Mary, running up to Jesus when there's a flashback and he's a kid. And she goes, Echwiana, and you're bawling. <laughs> you just violated the Ten Commandments, you inconsistent hypocrite. Forever. Can you go back to the start of the program? I already addressed it. Don't be a Johnny come lately. I already addressed that, Hail Mary. I already did go back to the beginning. 
No, there is no problem, Sargun. There is none whatsoever. It's an ancient practice that you even find support for in the odes of Solomon in the first century. Did you know that, Sargon David? The doing this, the cross, you'll find support for it in a document called the Odes of Solomon in the first century, showing you how ancient this practice is. Right? Okay. Now, with, with that said, do you see what the Bible is condemning? Exactly. We're icons, images of God. Do you see what the Bible is condemning? The Bible is not condemning images. It's condemning images of creatures that you believe are gods and goddesses and of false gods like Baal or Astarte or Zeus. That's what it's condemning. And when you take an image that God has fashioned and turn that into a god and you worship with gods and goddesses, that's idolatry. But let me again repeat. Let me ask. Alan Rule. Alan Rule. I'm going to ask him. I'm going to single him out. Brother, when you have that statue of Mary or of Peter, do you think that Peter is a god, a divine being, worthy of worship as a god? Okay. So can you tell me where this man is violating the Ten Commandments? Where is he in violation of Scripture? Okay, so is that clear? Is that clear? Now, what about Muhammad and smooching a black stone? Am I being inconsistent when I condemn Muhammad and Muslims for smothering, smooching, a black stone like the good little pagan he is. Am I being inconsistent? No, I'm not. Absolutely not. Hey, Ariel, what's up, brother? Absolutely not. Can I show you why I'm not being consistent? Uh, inconsistent? And by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm being very consistent in Jesus' name. Here, let me show you why. Can I show you? Here's my articles again. Let me give you the articles again. Please save that article. Please save that article. Okay. Use this information. Okay. Okay, are you ready now why I'm not inconsistent? Now here, I'm going to read from my articles because these Quranic verses are too long. Okay. Save these two articles. I just gave you two articles. Guys, are you with me? Are you being blessed? Are you being challenged? Are you being stretched to think more biblically? Am I helping you? And I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit's using me to help you. You learning? Okay. Let me repeat again so I don't get slandered. I didn't embrace communion of saints because I became Catholic or Orthodox. No. I embraced this doctrine because I became convinced against my will that there's plenty of biblical proof and support for it. And I yielded to what Scripture is taught. And that is honest to God. The Lord is hearing me. May the Lord sanctify me. That's why. So if you want to go and slander me, Tam Chimun, brother, brother. Tam Chimun became Catholic, brother. I'll be whatever God wants me to be. I will be whatever God wants me to be, as long as God is guiding me to his truth. Brother, Sam Chimun, he became Catholic, brother. Jihei became Catholic, brother. Oh, my goodness, what are you going to do? Oh, Okay, now, let me show you why I'm not being inconsistent when I condemn Muhammad, when I condemn Muhammad for being a stone-smooching pagan and not my brothers and sisters in Christ like the Orthodox and the Catholics. In fact, let me share some with you. I'm going to share some with you. When, and I believe it's from the Holy Spirit, if I'm speaking presumptuously, may the Holy Spirit forgive me. When... The Holy Spirit illuminated me to see the biblical basis for icons and all. I entered a Orthodox church, St. Haralambos. This is after, by the grace of God, I came to see a biblical basis for it. And I believe it's from the Spirit. If I'm wrong, Holy Spirit, forgive me, please, and save us from errors. And I mean that from my heart. Okay. I sat for the first time in my life. I sat there, and I finally understood and I appreciated the icons. I finally understood 
When I looked at it, I was in awe at what I was seeing. You want me there? I finally understood. When I saw it, I was in love with what I was seeing. I was moved. You know why? I felt free. I honestly did. I felt free because I became convinced the Bible doesn't condemn it. There's support for it. And then I could appreciate the beauty. I finally could appreciate the beauty. Because up until that time, I used to be scared and hesitant to even look at it because I thought I was committing adultery, idolatry. To the point, to the point that in the Assyrian church, when you enter the Assyrian church, there's a cross that you kiss. I wouldn't even kiss it because I thought it was idolatry. And then, and again, I'm trusting this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I beg you, guide me into all truth, all of us, and save me from error and idolatry in Jesus' name. That's been my prayer, and I mean it. After I could see the biblical basis for it, now I could appreciate it. Now I can kiss that cross knowing I'm not committing idolatry because I'm kissing it out of worship of my Lord that he used the cross to save me. You get my point? I finally could appreciate this. Let me share something what a, a priest told me that blew me away. Not I, I pray it's from the Holy Spirit that moves you. If it's from the Holy Spirit, I pray we're all moved to tears. Let me share something else with you. In the Church of the East, the Syrian Church, I don't know if it's in other churches. I don't know. I haven't gone to other churches, but I remember this. The deacon or the priest would come. He would have... Is it gold? You, the Assyrians here can help me out. Is it a golden jar of incense? And he would come. He would go to every row and he would just, you know, spread incense all over us. Okay. Okay. I don't know if it's a golden jar. You know what I'm talking about, Amanda Sergeant, right? I never understood why. Thank you, Sparky. I never understood. And then finally it dawned on me. You know that the priest would, would, burn incense, right, by the veil of the most holy place, right? Because that incense cloud represented God's presence. Why? Because God came down in the pillar of cloud. So when the smoke formed, it formed what looked like a cloud representing God in the cloud, right? Okay. I didn't know why they did it. They would come up to us and do it. Now watch this. I asked the priest, his name was Kasha Klutz. You know what he told me? And I was blown away. In fact, I'm even getting moved in my spirit. He goes, the reason why we do that, we come and do that, is because this is our way of acknowledging you are now the temple of God and God's presence dwells in you. I was blown away. I go, whoa. I'm even moved in my spirit. He said, we do this. Because we're acknowledging you are the temple of the living God. God's presence, the spirit lives in you. That's 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. Ephesians 2, 18 and 22. I was blown away. Because I, I never knew. I never knew it. Now, how do you how do you argue that? What's there to argue and and reject? What's there to fight? This is saying this is honoring the Lord, saying, Lord, this incense that was burned in your temple because your presence was there, I do this to acknowledge that this human being is your temple, made in your image, and that you dwell in Him who's born of the Spirit. Right? Is that amazing or what? When he told me that, I said, how do I argue with this man? How do I argue with this man? 
Yeah, I don't know what it is, shareable. I don't know. Just forgive me. I don't remember. I'm just, you know. So that said, let me show you why. Yeah, I know, Sargon, they didn't. But this guy, he was a Jewish convert to the Church of the East, actually converted to Christianity and became a priest in the Church of the East from Chicago, Asha Klutz. Asha Klutz. He's retired now. He explained it to me. And I sat there. Wow. I'm still blown away by it now. Like right now, I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, wow. It is amazing. Because it's biblical. Folks, 1 Corinthians 3.16. 1 Corinthians 6.19. Ephesians 2.18-22. It says, you are the temple of God, and God's Holy Spirit lives in you. Amazing. It's humbling. It's very humbling. Right? Yeah, see, I'm still like in awe thinking about it. How beautiful are these rituals, aren't they? If you understand them, there's beauty. There's depth in them. And it's all pointing to the majesty and the glory and the worship of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There is meaning. There is beauty. In these acts, these rituals, there is spiritual depth to it that I robbed myself of because I became so close-minded and thought. Guys, I'm telling you my background. I used to think that there were Jesuits everywhere working with the Illuminati and that there's a black pope controlling the pope. They call him the black pope who's a mason. And that Catholics were evil. I used to think that, and I'm 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 telling you, I used to think that, man. And I don't think that anymore. I don't think that anymore. Yeah, Jack Chick, I swear. Here, I'll, pr uh, I'll prove it to you, Jack Chick, the Death Cookie, one of the one of the, and remember uh, Alberto Vieira, who was a Jesuit spy who converted, and he supposedly. Claims that he was given secret order to infiltrate Protestant churches. And that supposedly his monsignor, whoever it was, I don't know, told him that Islam was created. <laughs> Islam was created by <laughs> Islam was created by the Pope. When that when that came out, I go, no, this guy's Looney Tunes. He's Looney bins. Islam was created by the Catholic Church to try to control the Arabs, but Muhammad proved to be a hothead. And then <laughs> He rebelled against the Catholic Church. And that Khadija bin Khoilet, she was a nun. She was a nun. I swear, this is what he wrote. I'm not lying to you. They got a comic book on it. That Khadija bin Khoilet was a nun. And that her, uh, whoever it is over her, sent her on a mission. Go find an Arab man and groom him to be the puppet of the Pope to control Arabia, but it backfired against him. I'm telling you. Okay. So you think about it. It's, uh, come on, man. You know, honestly, you poor Catholics, you get blamed for everything. You get blamed for everything, right? Yeah, I'm telling you, man. Who would have thunk it? Khadija bin Khawaited was a nun. Riviera, Alberto Riviera narrated that to Jack Chick, and Jack Chick took that information turned it into a comic book. It's called The Prophet. Yeah. Who the thunk it, man? Khadija was a nun, brah. And she gave up her vow to celibacy to then find an Arab in order to sleep with him and sire his children to groom him into becoming a prophet, a tool of the Pope. Right? But anyway, that was my background. That was my background. Okay, now, yeah, you can actually, I think it's online. Google it, Jack Chick, the prophet. Now, I'm not lying. I've read it. Okay, now, with that said, let me show you why I'm not inconsistent in condemning Muhammad as a stone-smooching pagan. Let me show you why. Are you ready now? I gave you the articles. I'm going to be reading from my articles for the most part. Okay? So are you ready? Let me show you why. The difference again. You can affirm icons and still condemn Muhammad as a stone-smooching pagan and not be inconsistent. Okay?
Oh, yeah, yeah, Umberto. Waraka Ibn Nofal, they'll say he was a Catholic priest as well. But let's begin. This is all of my articles. It's too long to quote. Okay, let me read to you a narration. Sahil Bukhari, Sahil Bukhari, volume 5, number 661. Sahil Bukhari, volume 5, number 661. Pay attention to what they used to do. Because this is going to give you the background of the black stone, where it came from. <clears throat> Narrated Abu Raja al-Utaridi. Abu Raja al-Utaridi. We used to worship stones. Pay attention. This is a pagan. We used to, we used to worship stones. And when we found a better stone than the first one, we would throw the first one and take the latter. But if we could not get a stone, then we would collect some earth and then bring a sheep and milk that sheep over it and perform the tawaf, that's the running around it. When the month of Rajab came, we used to stop the military actions, calling this month the iron remover, for we used to remove and throw away the iron parts of every spear and arrow in the month of Rajab. Abu Raja added, when the Prophet sent with Allah's message, I was a boy working as a shepherd of my family, camels. Where we heard the news about the appearance of the Prophet, we ran to the fire to Mus Musaylma al-Khadab. Khadab, Khadab. All right, let me repeat the first part again. We used to worship stones, and when we found a better stone than the first one, we would throw the first one and take the latter. So don't forget, worshiping stones, venerating stones, a pagan practice that Muhammad's pagan tribe engaged in. Okay, number one. Let me read some chronic verses. Okay. Chapter 5, verse 90 of the Quran. Chapter 5, verse 90 of the Quran. O you who believe, intoxicants and gambling, and stones, stones and divination arrows are an abomination of Satan's handiwork. As to such abomination that ye may prosper. Did you catch it? The stones that they venerate, the divination hours, uh, divination arrows, Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue, gambling and toxins, abomination of Satan. These are all Satan's handiworks. Are you catching that? Are you catching what Muhammad is saying? Stones that you venerate, use in idolatry and idolatrous practices, divining arrows, divining arrows, it's divining arrows. Okay. Intoxicants, gamblings, all abominations created by Satan. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now let me read some chronic verses. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 10, verse 18. Chapter 10, verse 18. And they worship beside the law. They worship, it's talking about the pagans at the time of Muhammad. And they worship besides the law things that hurt them not, nor profit them. Pay attention. Things that hurt them not nor profit them. And they say, these are our intercessors with Allah. Guys, please remember this passage. So pagans, why do you worship things that don't benefit you and don't harm you? Because they are our intercessors with Allah. Our intercessors with Allah. Right? Everyone getting it? Let me give you that chapter 10, verse 18 of the Quran. You got it? Let me post it again. Everyone got it? Okay, because watch what's going to happen with the black stone. Okay. Watch what's going to happen with the black stone. Say, do you inform Allah of that which he knows not in the heavens and on the earth? Glorify and exalted be he above all that which they associate as partners with him. Okay, now another verse. It's kind of lengthy. Chapter 7 of the Quran, verses 193 to 197. Chapter 7, verses 193 to 197. If ye call them to guidance, <clears throat> they will not obey. For you, it is the same, whether ye call them or ye hold your peace. Doesn't matter if you call them or ignore them. Verily, those whom you call on besides Allah are servants like unto you. Call upon them and let them listen to your prayer, if you are indeed truthful. Have they feet to walk with? Talking about their idols now, their stones and their idols. Or hands to lay hold with? Or eyes to see with? Or ears to hear with? Say, call your God partners, God partners, scheme, you're worse against me, and give me no respite. Tell them to punish me if they're real. For my protector is Allah, who revealed the book, and he will choose and befriend the righteous. Now watch this. But those you call upon besides him are unable to help you and indeed to help themselves. 
Okay, now notice what Muhammad said. You pagan Arabs, your idols and your stones can neither harm you nor benefit you. They can't intercede for you. <clears throat> you call on them and they can't do nothing for you. But what did they say? No, we call on these idols because they represent our gods and goddesses, and they're going to intercede for us. So now, according to Muhammad, if you venerate a stone, that's idolatry. That's worship. That's a work of Satan. You understand what he said? I gave you the verses, chapter 5, verse 90, chapter 10, verse 18, and this one. If you venerate a stone, that's idolatry. That's worship. That's a work of Satan. Okay, now why is that important? Let me repeat that part of 1018 again so you understand the language. Here it is. Watch this, guys. Watch this. Pay attention to what he said that the pagans told him. And they worship besides Allah things that hurt them not, nor, benefit, nor profit them. And they say, these are our intercessors of Allah. So why are you doing it? They can't benefit you. They can't harm you. Oh, because they will intercede with Allah. Do you guys catch that before I move on? I can't talk too loud. Did you catch it? Before I move on to show you the point? Okay. Now, notice what Muhammad does with the black stone. Guys, pay attention. I'll get shocked. Get ready for a shocker. Here's the shocker. This is found in Sahil Bukhari, right? You also find it in other connections. Sahil Bukhari, volume 2. Number 667, pay attention. Sahil Bukhari, volume 2, number 667. Narr narrated Ab Abis bin Rabiya. Omar, the second caliph, came near the black stone and kissed it and said, no doubt, I know that you are a stone and can neither benefit anyone nor harm anyone. Wow. Had I not seen Allah's apostle kissing you, I would not have kissed you. The very language of chapter 10, verse 18 of the Quran. The very language of chapter 10, verse 18 of the Quran. What did Muhammad say to the pagans? Why do you worship that which can neither hurt you nor benefit you? They said, well, because there are intercessors. What did Umar say? What did Umar say when he kissed the black stone? Here you go. He's talking to a stone. He's, he's, you see, he's senile. He's going crazy. He's talking to the black stone. No doubt that you are a stone and can neither benefit nor, nor harm anyone. Had I not seen Allah's apostle kissing you, I would not have kissed you. Wow. Omar said about the black stone what Muhammad said about the stones and the idols of the pagans. Same language. And the black stone was one of the stones that the pagans venerated. Now, you want me to refute, be skeptical to show that he's an ignoramus, he doesn't know the Bible, that the Holy Spirit wasn't just given to the apostles to teach? Yes, the Holy Spirit inspired them to give us God's words infallibly, but that the Holy Spirit also works through their successors after them. You want me to refute this ignoramus for speaking presumptuously as if he knows the Bible? 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. Let me just put this guy, let me school this guy who thinks... He knows the Bible. 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. And we come back to this issue. Okay. Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, the good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. Paul is not talking to an apostle. He's talking to Timothy. And he says, keep that which has been given to you by the Holy Spirit in us. So now be skeptical. Shut your mouth. Don't talk because you're an ignoramus. You don't know the Bible. You're going to get schooled. Humble thyself before you get humbled. Okay. Let me, which part of he's talking to Timothy and he says to Timothy, guard what you have by the Holy Spirit in you. Listen, moron. Timothy's not an apostle. He's talking to an, uh, someone who follows him and he says to him, guard what you have by the Holy Spirit in you. Shut your mouth. You got busted. Shh. Ish. Ish. Shh. Ish. 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 All right, come back. This is what happens when you have an idiot who thinks he knows the Bible. Humble thyself before you get humbled. Okay? Ish. Shh. Shh. 
Okay, folks, we need to send this guy on his merry way. Bye-bye. <laughs> that wasn't your argument, you idiot. You said the Holy Spirit was only given to the apostles to teach. Bye bye. Oh bye 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 bye. Oh bye bye. Oh bye 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 bye. Oh bye bye. Oh bye 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 bye. All right. Okay, now did you catch Omar's reaction? Did you catch Omar's reaction? Why does Omar describe the black stone? Why does Omar describe the black stone the way Muhammad described the idols and the stones of, of the pagans? Why did he describe it the same way? Can you guys help me understand? Why did Omar describe the black stone the way Muhammad in the Quran described the stones and the idols of the pagans? This black stone can't harm me nor benefit me. And that's what Muhammad told the pagans. Hey, you pagans, these stones and idols can't harm you or benefit you. But they were telling him, yeah, they can. They'll intercede for us. Right? Muhammad said, no way. Now, guys, you want to get even more shocked? Muhammad did to the black stone what the pagans did to it. Muhammad treated the black stone the same way the pagans did because the black stone was one of the stones venerated by the pagans. He just took it over. Let me show you what he said. Remember what they said. They said, the reason why we venerate the stones and the idols because they'll be our intercessors with Allah. That's chapter 10, verse 18. Let me now cut this passage and show you what Muhammad said. This comes from Sunan ibn Imaja. Sunan ibn Imaja. Read here, guys. Watch here. Read with me. Okay, watch here. Read this with me, guys. Read it. Okay. Now read. This is all my article. Read with me. Let me read it for you guys. Here you go. Okay. Sayyid bin Jubair is reported to have said, I heard Ibn Abbas saying that Allah's messenger said, this stone must come on the day of resurrection. This black stone will come on the day of resurrection and will have two eyes to see with a tongue to talk, right? A tongue to talk with bearing witness for him who caressed it with truth. Wow. Do you see what Muhammad did to the stone? He said, this stone on the day of resurrection will give two eyes and a tongue to talk and will come to those who caressed it and kissed it as Muslims and intercede for it. So wait, Muhammad, wait, Muhammad, wait, wait, wait. You condemn the pagans for worshiping idols and stones and condemn them for thinking they would intercede for them and told them straight up, they can neither harm you nor benefit you. But then you took one of the stones, the black stone, which was one of the stones they venerated and commanded people to kiss, kiss it, smother it like you did. And Omar, your companion, didn't know why. Why am I smothering it? Well, I got to do it because he did it because this stone neither harms nor hurt and nor benefits using the same language you did to decry what the pagans did. And then you justified it like they did. Muhammad, you justified it like they did. They said, well, the reason why we do it, they're going to intercede for us. And what was Muhammad's justification? Hey, that black stone is going to intercede for you. It's the right hand of Allah on earth. And on the day of resurrection, it will have eyes and tongue and speak and say to Allah, Allah, you see this person right here? You see Muhammad? He used to smother me and kiss me. And he kind of turned me on. Oh, oh, not too, right? So am I being inconsistent, folks? Am I being inconsistent when I condemn Muhammad as a pagan idolater, a stone smoocher, while affirming the icons of Christians? Am I being inconsistent? Can someone tell me I'm being inconsistent? Where am I being inconsistent? Okay, good. Now, let me read what the Bible says about this. This is all in my article, and we'll pretty much be done with the section. Okay. Let's see what the Bible says. Not to do. 
<clears throat> like the pagans, right? Here, Leviticus 26.1. Do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourselves, and do not place a carved stone in your land to bow down before I am the Lord your God. Okay? I can give you more verses, but here, let me give you this, and I'll show you that's what Muhammad did. Okay, you see that? Leviticus 26.1. One more time. Leviticus 26.1. Let's see. We'll see, Nada. You shall make no, you no idols, graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land. Now, remember, the black stone was a stone set up by the pagans. It wasn't commissioned by God. It wasn't commissioned by Abraham or Ishmael. It was a pagan stone, a stone set up by pagans. And God says, you don't do that. Because why did the pagans do it? Because these stones were taking, uh, taken as gods and goddesses. With me there? Okay. Not only that, you don't kiss them. You don't kiss them here. And you don't touch them. Here you go. 1 Kings 19.18. 1 Kings 19.18. Here you go. The idol of Baal. Idol of Baal, a false god. How did the pagans venerate it? Here. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth, every mouth that has not kissed him. Did you catch it? What did God say? You don't take an image or a stone and treat it as a god or goddess and worship it. Well, how do you worship it? By kissing it and bowing to it. That's exactly what Muhammad did. A black stone set up by pagans in the context of worshiping gods and goddesses. He then took it and kept it and he kissed it and smothered it. So he stands condemned by his own teachings and by the Bible as a pagan stone sm smooching idolater. Right? Where am I wrong? Hosea 13, verses 1 to 2. Maybe you can post that for me. Hosea 13, verses 1 to 2. You can post that for me. Shalom, were you here in the beginning? Tell me you were here in the beginning, because if not, I'm going to have to block you for asking me a question that I already answered. Were you here in the beginning? Okay, Hosea 13, verses 1 to 2. Let's read it. When Ephraim spake trembling, he exalted himself in Israel. But when he offended in Baal, he died. And now they sin more and more and have made them molten images of their silver and idols according to their own understanding, calves, all of the work of the craftsmen. They say of them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. Okay, folks, let, let's try this again. What's the difference? The difference here is when you take idols of creatures or stones and treat them as gods and goddesses and venerate them as gods and goddesses, kissing them because you think they're a god or a goddess, bowing to them because you think they're a god or goddess, you are committing idolatry. The black stone that Muhammad kissed and smothered, was that something fashion commissioned by God or was that a pagan artifact? One of the stones of the pagans that they erected in their worship of gods and goddesses. You see the difference? Hosea 13, verse 2. 1 Kings 19, 18. Leviticus 26, verse 1. So now what's the difference between an Orthodox and a Catholic and Mohammedans? No Orthodox takes an icon of John and treats John as a god worthy of worship no catholic who's informed takes a statue of peter thinks peter is a god worthy of worship that's not what they're doing whereas the black stone of muhammad was a pagan stone erected by pagans for gods and goddesses you see the difference now you see the difference now muslims will tell you well, when we kiss it, we don't treat it as God. And Abraham instituted it. Two responses. Number one, 
you may not treat it as a god, but you inherited it from paganism. You didn't inherit it from God, which leads me to the second point. Abraham never instituted that black stone because he never went to Mecca and wouldn't do so. So this is two strikes against you. You're taking a stone that was part of the idolatrous practices of pagans. And now you're trying to spiritualize it and ascribe it to Abraham. Abraham has nothing, nothing to do with your filthy stone. So don't even go there. Are you with me there? Do you see why someone who accuses me of being inconsistent is an ignoramus or a liar? One of the two, right? He's an, either an ignoramus or a liar. Because thank the Holy Spirit, I believe by his grace and mercy, I have thought about the issues deeply enough to understand why I'm not inconsistent. Now, finally, 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 are you ready for the final point? Are you ready for the final point? When a Muslim bows towards the Kaaba, ask them this question. Guys, get ready because we're going to be done with this. And I've made my case. Case is over. I don't want to hear this anymore. I'm done. It's archived. Go back. Hear my reasons. If you reject them, that's between you and God. If you think I'm misinterpreting, that's between you and God. Okay. You ask the Muslim. You ask the Muslim. When you face the Kaaba and you bow to it five times a day, is Allah's presence there? Is the presence of Allah in it? They'll say no. Does Allah dwell in it in some unique way while still being omnipresent? They'll say, no, Allah's not there. Okay. Why are you then bowing to a pagan shrine? Because that, again, is a pagan shrine. that wasn't created by Abraham and, and Ishmael. Why are you facing it and bowing to it when you don't believe God dwells there in some special sense? So that's idolatry. But guess what they're going to tell me? Ah, oh, but wait, the Jews bow down towards the temple. And this is where I'm going to bust them up. This is where I'm going to embarrass them. You know why? Let me show you why they bowed towards the temple. 1 Kings 8, 12 to 13. 1 Kings 8, 12 to 13. And I'm going to give you articles on this before I finish. Then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. Now watch. I have surely built thee a house to dwell in. A settled place for thee to abide forever. You see, the temple is where God would localize his presence in a unique, miraculous way. God's presence was there. Second Chronicles 6, verses 1 to 2. Second Chronicles 6, verses 1 to 2. Then said Solomon, the Lord shall say, the Lord hath said that he would dwell in the in the thick darkness. Loosen my tongue, Lord. But I have built an house of habitation for thee and a place for thy dwelling forever. So God is dwelling there in a unique, miraculous way. Jesus confirms this, Matthew 23, 21. And I'll give you a parallel with Moses. I'm going to give you a parallel with Moses in a minute. Okay, Matthew 23, 21. And whoso shall swear by the temple and sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. When you swear by the temple, you're swearing by the God who lives in it. Okay. Now let me show you a parallel at the time of Moses. The tent of meeting. The tent of meeting. Exodus 33, verses 7 to 11. Yeah. You see this pagan stone liquor ASD? Because he's stupid and literate like Muhammad. He says, Isaiah kisses pebble altar just as stone from angel. And he doesn't even know that he's misquoting Isaiah 6. All right. Exodus 33, verses 7 to 11. Guys, go ahead. I, you mods, you have my permission. Block at your own discretion. Okay. Exodus 33, 7 to 11. Exodus 33, 7 to 11. Read with me, guys. Guys, please read this, please. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp. And called it the tabernacle of the congregation. Now watch. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord Jehovah went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Now watch. 
read with me what happens. And it came to pass when Moses went out into the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses because they want to see where he's going. Until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar, the cloudy pillar, the, the pillar of cloud that God dwelt in and came down in, descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord Jehovah talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent. Every man in his tent. Verse 11. And the Lord Jehovah spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Did you guys catch it? Do you see why they bowed towards the tent, the tabernacle, and worshipped? Because God's presence was there. Do you see it? So why did the Jews bow towards the temple? Because God's presence was there. Why did the Muslims bow towards the Kaaba? Because they're pagans, idolaters, who foolishly and stupidly follow a stone smooching, Woman raping, woman whoring, false prophet, and son of Satan. You catch it? Because you ask them, is Allah dwelling there? No. Did the pagans venerate the black stone? Yes. Oh, but Abraham gave us the black stone and created the Kaaba. Lies from hell. Do you see why I'm not being inconsistent? Do you see why I am not being inconsistent? Now let me get you my two-part articles on. The temple versus the Kaaba. So, glory to Jesus Christ for how for bringing up this objection. Because if he didn't bring up this objection, I wouldn't have dealt with these pathetic arguments. Okay. Here you go. Two-part article. Save it. S study these links, these articles. Print them out, use them in your studies, and pass them on. And we're done. We're done. Here he goes. That's part one, and here's part two. The Kaaba, the great idol of Islam. The Kaaba, the great idol of Islam. The Kaaba, the great idol of Islam. Hank, if you haven't listened to my series on this, don't ask me, brother. I got multi-part series on communion of saints. Go to my YouTube channel, subscribe, search Communion of Saints, watch my multi-part series, and then if you still think I'm wrong, God bless you. The Lord be with you. God bless you. No, I haven't authored a book. Okay, so you save these links, save the articles, study the arg arguments, teach them to others, pass them on, hit the like button, subscribe, pray for me and my daughters, pray for our health, pray for our holiness, that the Lord Jesus will grant them salvation. Keep us in love with him. Pray for the, for the provision that I continue to do ministry until Jesus calls me home. Officially, the session is over. We're done. Okay? If after this you still argue with me, you're in the wrong place, in the wrong channel, go find another channel. Go listen to someone else. God willing, Lord Jesus willing, tomorrow I have another session, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, God willing, if the Lord is pleased. Yes. So let me take just one question, but don't Skype it. It's too late. Just text it. I'll take one question. Rene, Rene, I'm in love with you, Rene. All right. What happened to the Nubian princess? Did she left too? I'll take one question. Thank you, Yosha. And God bless you for the super chats and the supports. Keep praying for me that God will continue to support me for the glory of Christ. Any question? Okay, Shalom. Let's see if it's a legit question, if it's a waste of my time. He's in glory, al -Ruhu. He's not missing us. When you see Jesus, you never want to come back. Igor, I just gave you the articles with all the information. Did you save the articles? It was chapter 10, verse 18 of the Quran. Chapter 10, verse 18 of the Quran, right, and others. What the heck is self-flagellation? That's easy. Nothing in the Bible talks about it. But if you want, I'll, I'll flagellate you. I'll be more than happy to whip you. You can whip it. 
Now, this is a carnal song, Razzles. You see what you just did? In my pre-Christian days, I used to listen to these evil songs. I've repented. But unfortunately, these songs stay in your mind, right? Whip it. Whip it good. You can whip it. Whip it. Whip it good. You remember what I'm talking about? You guys remember that song? Yeah, in chapter 5, verse 9, he says, Stones are a work of Satan. How many of you remember that song? Shalom Lechi. As far as the Bible is concerned, I can't say what you're doing is wrong. Because when you kiss the image of Christ, it's because you're worshiping him. When you kiss the image of his blessed mother, it's because you're honoring her. And I can't say it's wrong. Because there's biblical basis to say it's not wrong. And by the way, it's not LMAO, monster. It's not LMAO. We don't say laughing my aspirations off. We say laughing my buttocks off. Okay? Let's keep it G-rated. Yeah, anything that you worship instead of God, anything that consumes your life and your time, anything that you live for becomes an idol. It becomes your God. Colossians 3 verse 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Yes, they did Arturus Vega. And Paul used that to then bring them to the knowledge of the true God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Okay, guys, read this. It, can money be an idol? Yes, here. Colossians 3, verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication. Mortify that. Die to fornication. Die to being unclean. Die to unnatural affection, like homosexuality, lesbianism. Evil concubescence. Man, that word is hard. And also, die to covetousness. Do not covet, which is idolatry. You see what Paul said? When you covet something, that becomes idolatry. Why? Because when you covet something, you make that thing the focus of your life and desire. Anything that becomes your focus and your desire becomes your God. Philippians 3, 16 to 19. See you. Go to answeringblog.wordpress.com. Answeringblog.wordpress.com. I have an article on Isaiah 9, 6. Okay. Philippians 3, verses 16 to 19. We're going to end it with this. Razo's lit biblical basis for it, but I'd like to whip you and cut you up. Philippians 3, 16 to 19. Okay. Read with me, guys. Philippians 3, 16 to 19. Nevertheless, Paul speaking, where to we have already attained, we haven't attained yet. We haven't reached our goal yet. Don't be so arrogant, think you've attained. No, heaven is our goal. We're not there yet. We keep striving. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Now watch. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Those who walk like us, live like us, worship like us, mark them out and imitate them and follow their example. Now watch here. Philippians 3, 18 to 19. Watch here. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and I'll tell you even weeping, breaks my heart to say this, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now watch verse 19, Philippians 3, 19. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Let's post Philippians 3.19 one more time. Philippians 3.19 one more time. Notice this. Philippians 3 verse 19. Whose end, the end result of their life is destruction. Why? Because their God is their belly. Their belly is their God. You know what it means? They worship their appetites. They worship their carnal desires. All they live for is their appetites, for sex, for gluttony for partying, and they even glorify their shameful living. They glorify being prostitutes. They glorify being porn stars. They glorify being adulterers and adulteresses and womanizers. They take glory in that. They boast in it. That's what it's saying here. So what, what is their God? Their appetites. What is their God? Their desires. They live for their desires, not for God. So what's the point here? Paul is saying, anything you live for, anything you desire more than anything, is your God. And that's an idol. Now, El Jeffy, let me shock you here. Orthodox, do you believe Jesus Christ founded the Orthodox Church? Hold on, hold on. Let me, let me, just, let me just say this. Orthodox, do you believe Jesus Christ founded the Orthodox Church? Just quickly. 
for the brother, not answer, but I want the ortho, Orthodox to answer. Okay, Orthodox, please answer. You believe Jesus established the Orthodox Church. So this Catholic person here, he said that Jesus established the Catholic Church. I don't know why I sound like a broken record. Do you understand? I wish everyone could be like Alan Ruhl and Ariel Gonzalez. These two are mature Catholics who love Jesus, and I consider my brothers born of the Spirit. Okay. But we got people in all camps that do damage for their own camp. He just said, Jesus established Catholic Church. Then the Orthodox is going to say, Jesus established the Orthodox Church. And there we go with the debate. <sighs> pins and needles, needles and pins. It's a happy man that grins. What am I mad about? Hey. We were sailing along. The fact is, Acturos, the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, the Syrian Church, they have a pedigree that's ancient. It goes back to the apostles. It's just historical. Right? I mean, you can't deny this. Right? But during the centuries, there was a split. In 1054 AD, there was a split. The Orthodox split from the Roman Catholic Church. Because you can ask them, they're here, so I don't want to be speaking for them in error. They think that the Pope usurped too much power and other issues such as the filioque clause. Okay, so that means that means that they're not in communion because they think that one of them fell off the bandwagon, but not completely, and so full communion doesn't exist between them. I don't know why. Okay, so El Jeffy. What do you say to the Orthodox? Are they part of the 43rd? And by the way, Al-Jeffi, you're a liar. You're a disgrace to your church. Because if you go and look at the source, 40,000 denominations, it doesn't refer to Protestants alone. It includes the Catholic in that list, the Orthodox in that list. And you see, you're, you're, you're just a stupid parrot. You're a disgrace to your church. Yes, yeah, send Abdul. You should join Muhammad in licking the black stone. And don't tell people you're Catholic. So send Abdul back to potato, potato. Yeah, Roman, you guys can settle it on your own channels, Roman. Roman, Catholic 777. You and the Orthodox, go to your channels and settle this debate. Okay, my friend? Roman Catholic, please, brother. It's not the channel for me. Hold on, Roman Catholic. Hold on. Roman Catholic, I'm going to tell you my way of how I... Calm myself down. See, we got a fight. Orthodox defense says that's not true, LOL. See, we started a fight. Guys, can you love me? Do you guys love me? Wait, 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 wait. Can you guys love me and not start this fight? Can you love me for the sake of the Lord Jesus and not start this fight, please? Could you do that for me? Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 man. Wait, man. You remember the debate? Wait, wait, wait. And now watch. Okay, watch here. This is how I mellow out. Logo. Wow, I feel peace already. Logo. Man, you don't believe you don't believe the peace I'm being full right. Logo. Logo. Wow. All right. Lord willing, see you tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, if God wills. Guys, bathe me in prayer and my daughters and fast for us and ask the Lord to keep guiding me to all truth. Listen, St. Dennis, anyone who says Chuck Norris is better than Bruce Lee, that's an automatic block. Okay. Now, Renee. I'm going to let the cat out of the bag, and we're going to end it here. Renee is a black belt in Taekwondo. That means if you get out of line, she'll axe kick you and split you in half. But, folks, I'm going to share this with you, then I'm going to have to edit this. Okay? I'm going to have to edit this because I don't want the Muslims to know. Okay, now, I'm going to trust you guys. You're not going to share it because I'm going to have to edit this, all right? But I'm going to let you in on a secret. Can I trust you not to tell anyone? Okay, 
I actually have an eight degree black belt and I'm a grandmaster. There are two systems. One system, I'm an eight degree black belt. The other system, I'm a grandmaster. So, but please, I'm gonna have to edit this because I don't want the Muslims to know. I'm an eight degree black belt in take your dough and I'm a grandmaster of take one to go. Eight degree black belt and take your dough and a grandmaster of take one to go. Now I have to edit this because I don't want the Muslims to know. Okay, you should see how amazing I am and take your dough and take one to go. Chumbi, chikariki, hana, tu, yeah. Okay, anyway. Christ is risen, risen indeed, and we love you, Lord Jesus. Wash us in your blood, seal us in your love, and fill us with your spirit. And Lord Jesus, come sooner than later. Maranathe. Kirelesun, kirelesun, kirelesun. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Father, Son, and Spirit. In Jesus' name, I'll see you tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Take care.